Um, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here at the School of Social Services Administration to be able to talk about uh, one piece of a part of a project that I've been working on for the last five years now, trying to understand how documentation status, how issues of race and ethnicity uh, shape uh, immigrants' experiences with the healthcare system. Um, and basically what I've been doing is trying to understand how policies that have implemented at the federal level, at the state level, shape people's experiences navigating things like healthcare and other types of social services. And also just their daily lives using Boston, the city of Boston, Massachusetts as the context for that. So I have focused on the city of Boston uh, for a couple of reasons, just in terms of thinking about um, it is the place where uh, Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts, implemented uh, state-level health reform, which ended up becoming the model for the Affordable Care Act, also known as the ACA, or also known as Obamacare. And I wanted to understand how, you know, within co in the context of Boston, if you were an immigrant, this policy that was praised so highly nationally, if you were an immigrant, could you get access to health coverage under the Massachusetts level reform in Boston? And then also over time, as the state of Massachusetts fully implemented Obamacare, how that ended up having an impact on reshaping the landscape for health care policy and other types of policy within the context of Boston. Uh, so today, uh, here is a brief outline of my talk. And basically what I'll be doing is answering the question or attempting to answer the question for this paper in progress, through this paper in progress, which is the basis for this talk, of how public policy facilitates a racialized citizen, non-citizen divide in U.S. society. Uh, so within much of the immigration scholarship, uh, immigration scholarship, and also in the broader society, there's often been this framing of this notion of undeserving undocumented immigrants pitted against deserving documented immigrants within the literature in terms of thinking about access to health care, access to other types of public benefits. And so in terms of thinking about prior public policy within terms of immigration and welfare, this, co this course had also been very much present in terms of thinking about what sorts of benefits people get access to and how documentation status played a role in shaping that process. Uh, more recently in terms of thinking about uh, health reform, uh, because uh, with the Affordable Care Act that was considered to be a historic change to the American health care system in a generation, wanting to understand how these particular policies in Massachusetts and at the federal level, Obamacare, how this also plays a role, documentation status and shaping what sorts of benefits in terms of health care people get access to. And even more recently than that, within the last couple of years under the Trump administration, there have been a lot of shifts in existing immigration policy that is also significantly having an impact not only on undocumented immigrants, but also documented immigrants of various documentation statuses from individuals from temp with temporary protected status to refugees uh, to uh, how many visas the U.S. government will issue for work visas and things like that. So getting, uh, trying to understand how various immigrant populations of different documentation statuses have been impacted in terms of thinking about public policy and the role of a racialized citizen, non-citizen divide. So the argument that I'm going to be making today is that public policy uh, historically and into the present has created classes of individuals on the basis of documentation status who are situated along what I call a racialized documentation status continuum. And I talk about this or call it a racialized documentation status continuum because if we examine uh, public policy historically within the United States, it's often had different racialized consequences depending on how policies were written, who they were intended for, who they were not intended for, um, and how race and ethnicity shaped who could actually benefit from certain pol public policies that were implemented by the government. So just to provide a little bit of background in terms of this notion of citizenship in the state, one of the things that's been coming up increasingly is thinking about this distinction within the social scientific scholarship on citizenship or what it means to be a legal or a state-recognized uh, state or political citizen. And so this means that a person is legally recognized as a citizen, let's say, in a particular nation state. And 
uh, when a person is legally recognized as a citizen, this typically gives them access to particular privileges and benefits that come with that. What that also means is that people who were not considered to be citizens or non-members might be excluded from receiving access to those same benefits. But at the same time, what a lot of social scientific research has found that in a number of societies, including the United States, for instance, that you can have people who are recognized as legal or social, uh, legal or formal citizens within a country, but who are not fully included as social citizens. They are not fully recognized and politically included uh, as citizens within a society. And so throughout US history, the citizenry has been stratified in what's been referred to as differentiated citizenship, where all legal citizens may not be social citizens. And so this is important in terms of thinking about not only the experience of immigrant populations, but also what are the experiences of different uh, populations um, in terms of thinking about racial minorities, for instance, thinking about the role of gender, sexual orientation, where people are formally recognized as citizens, but might not have or be able to exercise the full privileges and benefits that come with that. And so throughout US history, the US has been stratified in terms of citizenship among a variety of stratifiers. And today I'll be focusing on race and ethnicity and looking at how it intersects with documentation status to provide more vulnerability to immigrants and citizens of color in terms of thinking about their access to certain types of public benefits within the United States. So just to provide a little bit of background in terms of thinking about documentation status and marginality within the United States, uh, currently there are an estimated 41 million immigrants in the United States. Um, and it's estimated that about 11 million of them are undocumented or currently have no legal status uh, within the U.S. government or within uh, U.S. society. And so this is often in terms of the um, immigration policy and rhetoric at the public level has been of much discussion, certainly uh, within recent years. And so a lot of research has certainly demonstrated that immigration has had a significant impact on the United States racially in terms of thinking about demographic shifts that the United States is now experiencing. It is expected to continue to experience uh, politically in terms of thinking about the rhetoric around immigration and to what extent uh, will immigrants who eventually become citizens participate in the political process, uh, socially in terms of thinking about the incorporation of immigrant populations within the United States, and also economically, to what extent do immigrants contribute to uh, the U.S. economy? And what we've certainly been seeing in recent years um, is increasing racial and anti-immigrant sentiment that's being directed towards immigrant. And so in terms of thinking about this anti-immigrant sentiment, there is a perception and a fear of racialized and foreign others, people who were considered to be somewhat different from the general population. And so this is racialized in a particular way, such that when people hear the word immigrant, they might think of a particular phenotype or typical, uh, certain types of physical characteristics um, that plays a role in thinking uh, and having people think about immigration as a racialized issue. And so the issue of national security has also been highlighted in terms of propagating this fear of racialized and foreign others within the United States. And certainly uh, the notion of immigration or the issue of immigration has often been framed and racialized as a Latino issue such that when people hear the word Latino or maybe see someone who they perceive to be Latino, the assumption is that this person might be an immigrant. Um, whether or not that person is a citizen or not, there is an assumption of that. And so increasing researchers really start to look at this relationship between uh, how immigrants are racialized and how this has an impact on their experiences within the United States. Uh, so much of that research has documented the increasing role of discrimination um, not only in terms of interpersonal interactions, um, but also in terms of structural discrimination affecting people's ability to get jobs, shaping where people live, their larger experiences within the society, as well as increasing social exclusion and marginalization with certain groups really being targeted uh, for experiencing racialized anti-immigrant sentiment within the United States on the basis of being perceived as uh, racialized and foreign others. So um, within the scholarship on immigration, 
Uh, there's also been much research that's looked at this role of the construction of legality within the United States um, among children and adolescents, among adults, um, in terms of thinking about what it means to be legal within the United States um, or to also not be uh, legal to be, have undocumented status, but also thinking about the extent to which having documentation, um, having legal documentation status or the absence or lack thereof shapes people's experiences within the life course at different time periods. Uh, recent research uh, by Cecilia Menhivar also argues that there is this concept called liminal legality, where you might have immigrants who currently have legal documentation status, but that status is liminal or temporary. It's something that can be removed, and if it is removed, these people become undocumented. And so a lot of her work is focused on the experiences of immigrants with temporary protected status. And if you've been following immigration policy over the last couple of years, you will likely know that under President Trump, he's decided to cancel temporary protected status for a number of immigrants from a range of countries, uh, El Salvador, Haiti, Nicaragua, um, just to name a few. And so essentially, when the temporary protected status for those immigrants ends, they will be shifted into the undocumented category. And so this is why Menhivar argues that these people have precarious immigration status. It's not one that's permanent, it's temporarily or liminally legal. And other research is also focused on how immigrants, regardless of their documentation status, if you are a non-citizen, all of them are vulnerable, even green card holders, legal permanent residents, also known as LPRs, are subject to deportation. Um, and so increasingly what research is showing is that it's not just the undocumented who are vulnerable to exclusion and deportation, but increasingly immigrants, regardless of their documentation status until they are citizens, are vulnerable to detention and to deportation by the U.S. government. And so increasingly, more and more policies are starting to reflect this reality within the United States. Um, but we can't talk about the role of immigration in this process without also talking about the role of race. So if we think about U.S. immigration policy throughout American history, race and ethnicity have been a basis for determining citizenship in this country until the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, prior to that, um, Mo a number of immigrant, a number of groups in the United States were not eligible for citizenship or even to naturalize as citizens um, because race and ethnicity was used as a basis for determining that. And certainly, as um, the U.S. immigration regime developed in terms of thinking about border security and uh, enforcement, the notion of the category illegal developed in response to this as restrictive policies started to be put into place from the 1800s even through the present day. Um, and so this has also been racialized in terms of thinking about how there's often been more of a focus on the southern border of the United States as opposed to the northern border with Canada. And again, the racialization of immigrants um, as Latino and more specifically Mexican or Mexican American. Um, in 1996, some very important um, uh, laws were passed. Uh, immigration policy was passed in 1996, which became the basis for making employment verification an important aspect of trying to control immigration or limit immigration um, in the United States, additional with more border security, and also making it a crime to have fraudulent documents. And so this represents the last time there was any sort of comprehensive immigration reform in the United States. Um, DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, um, no longer exists, or um, it was supposed to come to an end. It's been held up in the federal courts, so we'll have to kind of see what happens with that in terms of as an example of how, um, of how uh, current immigration policy is shifting quite quickly with regard to people's different statuses. And then also at the state level, we're seeing that in the absence of comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level, that some state governments have started to make efforts to either try to implement either immigrant inclusive policies for the immigrants living in their jurisdictions or either creating more hostile anti-immigrant <coughs> policies so that uh, it will deter immigrants from coming to their states or either making them leave. 
And so given the demographics of immigration in the United States in terms of racial and ethnically, uh, these policies in terms of thinking about U.S. immigration policy disproportionately affect people and communities of color. And so race is certainly a part of this process. When we look at welfare policy in the United States, another policy realm, race has also been a part of that process as well. So with the New Deal reforms, uh, race and gender were used as a basis for exclusion, uh, despite eligibility on the basis of citizenship. So for instance, uh, African Americans and Mexican American citizens were not given access to New Deal reforms, but uh, white immigrants were often encouraged to apply for some of these programs. And so this is an example where citizenship did not play as much of a role for white immigrants, but um, in terms of their inclusion, or they were included despite not being citizens, and you had citizens, formal legal citizens, who were not included. And also in terms of welfare policy in the United States, there have often been racialized stereotypes of undeserving recipients and welfare queens in terms of the use of public benefits in the United States. And then in 1996, uh, there was also welfare reform passed the same year as that other immigration policy, which had very significant implications in terms of immigration for immigrants in this country. It implemented a five-year residency bar for green card holders to receive any sort of public benefits from the U.S. government. So what this meant was that if you were a legal taxpaying immigrant and you had a green card and you'd been here for less than five years, you were no longer eligible to apply for things like Medicaid, Social Security, Medicare, even though you're paying into the program, you had to have a green card for five years before you reached your eligibility level. The other reason this policy was important too is because any other immigrants who did not have this status also, it made it difficult for them to receive any federal benefits from the U.S. government. So undocumented immigrants, most visa holders, um, and other documented immigrants who also were ineligible to receive certain types of federal benefits as a result of this policy. And then lastly, in terms of thinking about health policy, uh, documentation status has been and remains a basis for ineligibility for Medicaid and other types of public uh, health care benefits. And what research has shown is that uh, even under the Affordable Care Act that there are still ethno-racial disparities in access to coverage and care um, despite eligibility on the basis of documentation status, particularly uh, for black and Latino, blacks and Latino Americans. And so in terms of thinking about the role of policy, it's had a, an impact for different racialized populations and also for immigrants as well in terms of their ability to access particular benefits. And then certainly when we think about the realm of law enforcement, criminal justice, and penal policy in the United States, uh, race has explicitly been a part of this process um, in terms of thinking about racial profiling. Increasingly, uh, people who look like immigrants being pulled over by police or immigration enforcement and asked to see their papers being profiled on that basis, that also has disproportionately had an impact on uh, minority communities in terms of thinking about the criminal justice system. So when we think about all of these policies together in terms of the criminal justice system, welfare policy, immigration policy, these various policy realms, they've had um, a, a significant impact in terms of thinking about various types of disparities uh, for ethno-racial groups in the United States. Um, and so that's had a really significant impact not only on immigrants, um, but also on citizens of color, so non-citizens and citizens of color in terms of thinking about this intersection between race, ethnicity, and documentation status. Uh, there's also been a gendered impact of this as well in terms of thinking about uh, the exclusion of certain populations, particularly poor men of color when it comes to receiving or not being able to receive certain types of benefits. Um, and what this demonstrates is that there is an intersection of de jure or legally or law-based discrimination that happens at the level of public policy, but also de facto discrimination in terms of thinking about for minority populations, whereby de jure race-based discrimination has decreased or ended, but people continue to experience de facto discrimination on the basis of their uh, race and ethnicity within the United States. And finally, we have to think about the role of relationality. When we're thinking about these various documentation statuses, 
it's very difficult to understand how a person could be undocumented unless there is a relational category of someone who is documented or a citizen. In terms of thinking about the types of benefits and privileges one can receive in terms of those documentation status categories where you understand the importance of one category in relationship to the other. Um, and also in terms of thinking about the importance of race and ethnicity within the United States, similar in, similarly in terms of thinking about um, racial inequality within the United States, it's hard to understand disparities um, among different racial and ethnic groups without comparing these different groups to each other. And so now as I get ready to address the question that I presented for today's talk, I want to talk about uh, the data and methods that I used uh, for this particular presentation today. Um, so one of the things that I did in this project that was a multi-year uh, multi project, um, and also I looked at different types of public policies, but I did a policy analysis of the Massachusetts level state health reform and also the Affordable Care Act reform to better understand the role of documentation status and race and ethnicity in sort of shaping access to coverage under these uh, reforms. Um, and also in order to better understand the role of this, I had to look at how health policy in the United States intersects with other types of policies, so immigration and welfare policy. And so what I mean by that is in order to understand what people are eligible for in terms of health policy, you often have to ask what is someone's documentation status. And that documentation status in terms of immigration policy helps determine what they have access to under health policy. Uh, for this project, I also wanted to get a better understanding of um, different types of what I call important stakeholders' perceptions on the role of documentation status and race and ethnicity for looking at issues of healthcare access. And so I interviewed three different stakeholder groups in the Boston area. Uh, the first group that I interviewed were immigrants uh, who were typically Brazilian, Dominican, and Salvadoran immigrants. Um, I selected those three groups because one, they're racialized as Latino within the United States. Number two, each of those groups has different types of documentation status. Brazilians tend to be undocumented. Uh, Dominican immigrants tend to have green cards to be citizens. And Salvadoran immigrants, some of them might ha uh, have temporary protected status. So in order to be able to look at different documentation statuses, I wanted to interview groups that had a wide range of them, at least according to the literature. Additionally, um, each of these groups in terms of how they are racialized, phenotypically they look a little bit different. Uh, Brazilian immigrants tend to be lighter or whiter in terms of if we're thinking about uh, racial categorization in the United States. Dominicans tend to be darker or blacker. And then Salvadoran immigrants phenotypically usually fall in between uh, both of those groups in terms of their uh, appearance. And because all of these groups live in close proximity to each other in the Boston area, there are very few or hard, there are actually no other cities um, in the United States where you have large numbers of each of those groups living in close proximity to each other. So that's another reason why Boston was ideal for this place, for this study. I also interviewed a set of healthcare providers because I wanted to understand from the provider perspective, what has the impact of the implementation of these different policies been on your ability to provide care for your immigrant and minority patients? What sorts of things do they talk with you about when they come for a doctor's appointment? Do any of them talk about feeling unsafe coming into the clinic for a checkout because there was an immigration raid in their neighborhood the night before. So I wanted to understand from the provider perspective, what are the things are you seeing as a provider um, that these policies, how have they played a role in shaping your ability to provide care for your patients? And then lastly, because I wanted to get a sense of the broader context, social context of Boston, and what other factors might be shaping people's ability to, to uh, access health care and coverage within Boston. I also interviewed uh, employees from different immigrant, immigrant and health advocacy organizations within the city of Boston to sort of learn what other sorts of things are happening in Boston. For instance, if um, while Boston uh, or the state of Massachusetts has inclusive health care policy, how might the fact that undocumented immigrants can't get driver's licenses in Boston shape 
uh, immigrants' mobility getting around Boston and their ability to, let's say, go to the doctor when they get sick. So how do these different things that are happening on the ground shape people's experiences? And so ultimately, I wanted to understand how all of these factors, documentation status, race, ethnicity, how they shape people's experiences with the healthcare system, but also in their everyday life in terms of actual mobility, comfort, leaving their home, going to work, going to the doctor, taking their children to school, and how race, ethnicity, and documentation status influence that. So here is a uh, table uh, with all of the different people that I interviewed. And so I collected data at two different time periods for this project. Um, when I first started the project in 2012 to 2013, this was under the original Massachusetts state level health reform. Um, and so uh, here is uh, the total number of people that I interviewed for the study at that time. Um, I went back to Boston in 2015 to do another set of data collection, um, for primarily because Massachusetts implemented the Affordable Care Act and the policy context under which I collected this data no longer existed. And the state of Massachusetts actually had to rewrite its health care policy to make it conform with the Affordable Care Act because the ACA was more restricted to immigrants than the state level policy in Massachusetts. And I wanted to understand how the shift from the Massachusetts state level reform to Obamacare transformed the health care landscape on the ground for immigrants. And so that's why I collected data at these two different time periods. Uh, here, just to get a better sense of some of the demographics of the immigrant sample in both time periods, um, they were predominantly women that I interviewed. Uh, median age for the Brazilians was about 40 in both time periods, so a little bit older um, for the Dominicans. I added Salvadorans in 2015 to 2016, again, because I wanted to get a sense of the role of how adding a population with temporary protected status might have some impact on people's experiences accessing health care. Here you can see the various range of documentation statuses for uh, both samples. Uh, so as you can see, uh, for Brazilians, um, a good number uh, were undocumented, but there are also some with visas and green cards, and then a few who were naturalized citizens. But regardless of these differences in documentation status, Nearly all of the immigrants that I interviewed had some type of health coverage in the state of Massachusetts, so very few of them were uninsured. And so basically what this demonstrates is that in a context like Massachusetts where they had this inclusive health policy, that people were able to actually sign up for coverage and access some type of health coverage within the state of Massachusetts. Uh, here are just some of the demographics on uh, the healthcare providers from the Boston Health Coalition, which is a multi-hospital clinic social uh, network within the city of Boston that has sites in various parts of the city. And so I interviewed a range of providers with various types of titles, um, and the majority of them were white, but a good number were also I self-identified as Latino or Hispanic across both of the samples. And then lastly, in terms of thinking about the different types of immigrant and health at, uh, organizations, uh, the employees that I interviewed, um, some of them were focused more on Brazilian or Salvadoran or Dominican immigrants. Some were more geared towards immigrants in general or either health issues. And then I was able to interview uh, some people from the local and state government um, in the second sample. So again, my goal was to be able to interview people from these different stakeholder groups to get a better sense of how these different policies um, were shaping immigrants' experiences uh, navigating the healthcare system on the ground in the Boston area. Uh, I also conducted ethnographic observations at different immigration and healthcare events throughout the city. Sometimes I served as a translator for some of the organizations um, since I speak uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Spanish. Um, and so this was something that uh, really allowed me to get a, also a better sense of what was happening on the ground too through my involvement and volunteering with some of these organizations. Um, and in terms of analyses, I can talk more specifically about this in the Q&A if people have many more specific questions. But some of the things that I was looking for when I analyzed the data using in vivo qualitative <coughs> software was access to health coverage and care in terms of the role of documentation status, uh, race and ethnicity in that, daily and overall life. So again, this notion of mobility, what are your daily experiences life, 
like what do you, how do you feel about your quality of life as an immigrant living in the context of Boston and also trying to access um, and navigate the healthcare system. So in terms of thinking about findings, uh, before I present the racialized documentation status continuum, I do want to talk about um, the documentation status continuum, which is a separate paper, but I do want to sort of outline what this theoretical framework is because I build on it to talk about the racialized documentation status continuum. And so as a result of doing the analysis for this data, particularly looking at policy analyses and how documentation status shape access to healthcare in Massachusetts, um, what I found was that documentation status uh, exists, or I argue that we should think about documentation status as something that exists along a continuum rather than it being uh, something that's thought of as more of a binary between undocumented or documented immigrants. Um, and so, in terms of thinking about public policy, what I found through this data is that there are various documentation statuses that exist that are ascribed by a current public policy within the United States. And so this has an impact in terms of thinking about political and socioeconomic consequences in terms of who can vote, what sorts of access to benefits people can get. And because our laws and our policies, the way they are written, ascribe these documentation statuses uh, different benefits, this becomes a legal basis for discrimination whereby people's documentation status is used as a basis to exclude them from receiving access to certain benefits within the United States. And so what I argue is that you have undocumented immigrants at one end with citizens, U.S. born citizens at the other end with the range of other documentation statuses in between. And where you fall within this continuum determines what sorts of benefits you get access to within the United States in terms of public policy. Uh, what's really most important to remember about this is that all non-citizens are deportable by the U.S. government, even if you're a green card holder and you've been here for 20 years. Um, if you get pulled over for a minor traffic and um, a minor traffic citation, that could start deportation proceedings against someone. So this vulnerability is something um, that is certainly uh, happening quite a bit. And also naturalized citizens, uh, certainly under the current administration, uh, which has developed a uh, naturalization task force is actually starting to review the applications of recently naturalized citizens. Uh, and if it's determined that they had any fraudulent documents or lied at any point of the immigration process, they can be stripped of their citizenship and because they're no longer a citizen, they would then be deportable. Um, and so within this continuum, U.S. born citizens are the most privileged in that they're entitled to all benefits and it's very difficult to strip a U.S. born citizen of their citizenship. And so within this continuum, movement to the right increases access to benefits um, and movement to the left increases more vulnerability. So I'm not going to focus on all of the details within this continuum just in the interest of time, but what I will quickly say is that if you can see here, uh, undocumented immigrants are at this end and right now I have two different categories with high priority immigrants, undocumented immigrants being the ones who are most vulnerable to deportation. At the other end, I have U.S. born citizens here. And so these are all of the other different documentation statuses that currently exist. Uh, the numbers in parentheses here are the years in which U.S. government <coughs> laws um, created those particular categories um, within the United States. Um, and then these numbers here are just in terms of uh, population size within the United States. So 11 million undocumented an estimated 10.4 million visa holders. And you can see that there are various types of visa holders too. Um, so in the Q&A, if you wanna have more specific questions about why I arrange the groups in this particular way, I'll be happy to do that. But like I said, the takeaway point from this particular slide is to just for you to be able to visualize what this continuum looks like and how, uh, again, the closer you are to the left, the most vulnerable you are, um, to uh, deportation, but again, all of these groups are considered deportable by the U.S. government. And then non-deportable here are citizens, although um, depending on 
what happens with this task force, I might have to move this line over to here. Um, and the reason I say that is because these policies keep shifting and as I work on these papers, things keep shifting and I have to try to adjust uh, my research or uh, the theoretical frameworks as I'm developing at them as I do that. So um, now that I've talked about the documentation status continuum, I do want to focus on how I now argue that this intersects with race and ethnicity in terms of creating a racialized documentation status continuum. So when we think about the importance of race and ethnicity throughout U.S. history, there have been various uh, ways in which uh, racial and ethnic minorities have been excluded from particular benefits, in some cases not even considered citizens or eligible to apply for citizenship. Um, and certainly more recently, the issue of immigration is typically framed as a Latino or minority issue whereby um, if people hear the word immigrant, they're less likely to think of, let's say, uh, an immigrant from the UK, for instance, that's living in the United States. Typically, the image that people have in mind when they hear the word immigrant is of a person of color, typically someone who's Latino. Um, in terms of thinking about the history of race in the United States, racial disparities uh, between white, black, Latino, and Asian Americans continue into the present day. Um, and research has suggested that um, that it's becoming or perceived to be becoming even more prevalent um, in the present um, in the United States. Um, and also in terms of thinking about the role of white privilege or having a white or what could be perceived as a white phenotype is something that might benefit some groups more than others regardless of let's say the racial group that they're in. Um, and I say that because for instance there are some immigrant groups that are some individuals who um, if they don't say anything, but just based on their phenotype, they're perceived to be white. Um, but then once they speak and they speak with maybe a strong Spanish or a strong Portuguese accent, their accent others them in a way that they are no longer perceived as white. So this role of thinking about who's racialized in particular ways is also important too. And then also when we think about the intersection of race, ethnicity, and documentation status, uh, most current immigrants are people of color, so they experience a double vulnerability, one because of their documentation status in terms of experiencing de jure discrimination, but also by being people of color in terms of also experiencing de facto race-based discrimination in the United States. And also, citizens of color continue to be subjected to de facto discrimination. Um, and so immigration and law enforcement affects these groups disproportionately. And so certainly within the last few years, there have been a number of incidents, for instance, of unarmed black men who've been shot by the police who are citizens formally, but they are not perceived as full social citizens of the United States, or there is still this fear of them as a racialized other. And so this example in terms of thinking about how immigrants and citizens of color are very much vulnerable to experiencing this de jure uh, and de facto discrimination in the present day. So here is um, my uh, image, uh, or here is my uh, visual representation of this racialized documentation status continuum. So it's a little bit harder to read, and I will say that this is a work in progress, so if you feel that there are ways I can improve on this, I do welcome your feedback because I'm still trying to figure out the best way to visually represent this racialized uh, continuum, documentation status continuum. So on the bottom here in the x-axis, I have the documentation status with the most vulnerable to, to deportation at the left with undocumented immigrants here. And then on the right, U.S. born citizens with least vulnerable to deportation. And these are the same categories from the original documentation status continuum. Um, here in the X and the Y axis, this is race and ethnicity, and I have them organized from least racialized in terms of thinking about within the United States, the white population is thought of as the normal or the least racialized population, and going down towards the bottom, the most racialized with the black population at the bottom. Again, I'm still trying to figure out the best way uh, to categorize and arrange groups here, but I drew upon uh, Eduardo Benilla Silva's Latin Americanization thesis article to, in terms of thinking about how to arrange these groups hierarchically uh, within the current U.S. context. So here, uh, basically I'll just briefly explain uh, what I have here in the image. 
So basically, in terms of thinking about this racialized documentation status continuum, on the left here uh, would be, let's say, a blacker or a darker undocumented immigrant who would most likely uh, to be stopped, let's say, and deported. If we're thinking about, let's say, a racial profiling example, so a, pro a policy like stop and frisk, for instance, in New York City in terms of thinking about who's more likely to be stopped by the police or immigration or law enforcement. Uh, and so an undocumented immigrant and also a black or U.S. born citizen would be more likely to be stopped. Uh, but in the event of being stopped, the black immigrant would be much more vulnerable because he could be subject to deportation on the basis of that stop, although the black citizen, U.S. born citizen, would not be able to be deported. He could end up in jail or in the criminal justice system. So this demonstrates how both groups are disadvantaged, although only one of these groups would be more likely to be deported. And then here towards the top of the chart here, a uh, whiter or lighter undocumented immigrant will least likely be stopped by immigration or law enforcement. But if they are stopped, then they would be subject to deportation. Um, whereas a whiter or lighter U.S. born citizen would be least likely to be stopped and also certainly not be deported or, um, or subject to detention within this particular framework. So in terms of this framework, the goal again is to show how certain populations on the basis of their documentation status alongside um, their racial and ethnic group membership or how they're racialized by the broader society would be more likely to be or have, uh, have some contact with immigration and law enforcement and possibly be detained, deported, or arrested on the basis of that interaction. All right, so now I just want to show a little bit in terms of thinking about the role of health coverage and how this plays out with the documentation status continuum um, under Massachusetts policy and also under the Affordable Care Act. So in terms of thinking about the different categories that I had within the documentation status continuum, you can see under both categories that essentially the status that you have determines what you had access to in terms of health coverage. So if you look at the ACA or the Affordable Care Act, essentially your options are much more limited for what you have coverage for until you are a green card holder here uh, for more than five years or you have temporary protected status or a refugee or asylee status. But if you're undocumented or you have DACA or you have a visa, you're very much limited or much more limited in terms of what you get access to. Um, in Massachusetts, you do have access to some coverage, but those coverage options are, again, delineated by documentation status. The closer you get to citizenship, the, more, the closer you get to being eligible for more types of options in terms of health care coverage options in Massachusetts. Prior to uh, the APCA implementation on the original Massachusetts level reform, and then also after the ACA. So very much in Massachusetts and also at the federal level, your documentation status uh, has a big impact on shaping what coverage options you have access to in the United States. And when we think about the role of being a person of color trying to access and navigate the healthcare system, that also creates additional barriers to care in some cases. So for instance, one of the social workers that I interviewed at the Boston Health Coalition in 2012 talked about how being a non-citizen of color strain healthcare, strains healthcare access even if you do have coverage. So you might have access to coverage, but it's difficult to use it for particular reasons. And so here she talks about how we face issues with Latino patients who are facing deportation because they were coming to the clinic and they were pulled over. There was a time period when the new reform came about and the new law was put in place that the police were going and stopping people and doing raids. So a lot of our patients got caught. We had a patient coming to the clinic and they called to say, I'm not going to make it to the visit because on my way to the clinic, I saw a police car, so I'm turning around. And then she also talks about how patients get afraid to drive without a license. And so here is an example of how in the healthcare realm, you have inclusive policy where people have access to coverage, but on the other hand, because they're undocumented, they can't get driver's licenses, and they're also afraid if there's an immigration raid in their community the night before from going to see their doctor the next day. So an example of how non-citizens of color are doubly vulnerable to uh, being 
excluded into experiencing or being penalized uh, for um, being in the context of Boston in the United States, even though they have access to coverage, they can't fully use it because of the fear that comes with being undocumented. One of the other things that came up too is uh, in terms of thinking about how immigrant populations and also citizens of color in Boston experience mistreatment that's tied to the intersection of race, ethnicity, and documentation status. And so a Salvadoran pastor that I interviewed in 2015 says, if you're more like dark skin, sometimes that plays in your favor because they, ICE might say he's African American. But our people, Salvadorans that are like Indian type of color, we have a huge disadvantage. Because if you're illegal but you're from Ireland and you're illegal but you're from El Salvador, who has a better chance when ICE comes to a tea station? <laughs> they have a profile and they won't stop any white people thinking that they are illegal. And there are some of our people that are very, very white looking that they don't get in trouble so much. So here is this clear distinction of thinking about this racialized documentation status continuum where Salvadorans, regardless of their citizenship status, depending on how they look and how they're racialized by others within that hierarchy, how that has an impact on whether or not they'll get stopped at the T station, which is the name of the public transportation system in Boston, whether they'll get stopped by ICE if they're light skinned or darker skinned, and whether that could lead to them eventually being deported and being targeted. I also think it's interesting too where he talks about how if you're more light dark skinned, that that actually plays in your favor because ICE or most people typically don't look at African Americans and think that they're undocumented immigrants. There is an assumption that yes, they're black, but they're probably a citizen. And so he talks about this as though it's a benefit in this particular case. And so how people are racialized by others has an impact on shaping whether or not or the ways in which they will be singled out or targeted perhaps by immigration enforcement or law enforcement and how that can lead to different consequences depending on the assumptions that are made about people based on how they look in their documentation status. The other thing that came up in my research was this notion of the relationship between documentation status and race and ethnicity in terms of people being aware of how the positionality that they have individually is, not, um, is tied to how they recognize people in other documentation status, is what benefits and privileges that they get, and, aware, and an awareness of how that plays out. So one Dominican immigrant that I interviewed in 2012 talked about how even within his family there were big differences in his own experience because he was undocumented. But his family members came with green cards and he said they arrived fine, different from me because I was illegal. He said they arrived, they could get work and apply and get apartments. They arrived good and here I have suffered so much because there is this enclosure and the depression and so much stress. And he says here as an immigrant you're less they treat you or they are racist towards you. If you're Hispanic, don't know English, and don't have papers, they believe you're a pickpocket, that you're a thief, that you're a nobody. And it shouldn't be that way because we are all human beings, even if you don't have papers. So here he talks about his experience was much more difficult adapting to the United States, one, because of his undocumented status. And he recognized how difficult, much more difficult his life was compared to his documented family members that came with green cards. But the role of race is also evident in this too because he talks about how immigrants are racialized and stereotyped in a particular way and how he feels that in terms of his interactions with Americans and people thinking that he's a thief on the basis of that. And then also one of the things that came up in my data, particularly around the issue of temporary protected status or TPS, is that this notion of the Salvadoran community, people with that status, not feeling like they could feel fully settled in the United States. Um, and so one of the people from the Salvadoran immigrant organizations I interviewed talked about how um, Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador at that time, so uh, TPS, he said they'd been in TPS for about 15 years. That's how long they'd been in that status in the US. And he says that they feel they are eager to earn their legal permanent residence because they feel they earned it. He says, we are tired of being in this process of renewing, having to pay $465 to work for the, wait for the work permit. 
So one of the things about TPS status is that you cannot be put on the path to get a green card with temporary protected status. It's just a status that you're kind of stuck in. There really is no path to citizenship unless maybe you marry a citizen or someone sponsors you. But in terms of directly being able to be on the path to becoming a citizen, there is no way to do that with temporary protected status. And so this is what he talks about, this limbo that people are living in, that liminal legality that Cecilia Menhivar has written about in her research. Um, and he even talks about how people sometimes lose their jobs while they're waiting for their work permits to be renewed. And he says, I guess people who don't have any piece of document, it's worse. It is they feel that now with the election time, talking about deporting specifically from the Republicans, saying we're going to deport every single undocumented here. That doesn't bring you peace of mind. It stresses you out every day. It makes you sick because you're thinking, am I going to be deported? So here is this notion of, again, the liminal, the liminal legality of this population, but also the potential health implications that if you're constantly stressed out about your status on a day-to-day -day basis, and now that TPS has been suspended for these groups, this is likely going to be their reality unless there is a way that it's reinstated for these populations. And so lastly, the other thing that I want to talk about is the role of how movement along the continuum in terms of if you're able to move towards citizenship or towards getting a green card on the continuum in terms of uh, public benefits, this can improve your coverage eligibility. And so a Brazilian immigrant that I interviewed talked about how when she came to the United States, she came on a tourist visa, she overstayed that visa. Um, and she became undocumented. And she said she was afraid to go to the doctor because she thought that um, if she didn't pay the medical bill, the police would come to her house and deport her. So she didn't understand that there was a separation between the healthcare system and the uh, criminal justice system in terms of the policing. Um, and she says, when you are illegal, you are afraid. And so eventually she was able to get her green card, and that allowed her to be able to sign up for state-provided coverage in Massachusetts, which improved her access to health care dramatically. And she talks about how when she got the letter, she cried because she was so happy that she could finally have access to health insurance. And so her example demonstrates how if you are able to somehow adjust your status and move towards the right in the continuum, even as a person of color, that it increases your access to particular benefits that come with documentation status. And so to conclude, um, some of the things that we have to think about in terms of health policy in the United States and other types of policy um, is that uh, with ACA implementation and repeal attempts, um, that the impacts of some of the things that I've seen on the ground in Boston are going to vary depending on where people live in the United States. Do you live in a state that fully implemented the ACA or that did not implement the ACA? And then if you're living in a particular state as an immigrant, are there immigrant inclusive policies that might make it easier for people, regardless of documentation status, to be able to access health coverage or some other types of social services? Um, and so what we've seen from repeal attempts and existing policy debates is that we're likely going to see more and more divides nationally in terms of health policy and also thinking about the racialized consequences of health policy or lack of access to health coverage. Uh, certainly, uh, there will continue to be disparities by race, by ethnicity, um, by documentation status, and certainly by state of residence. And so one of the things that I've learned from working on this project that it's not just about what your documentation status is and in the context of this particular talk, what your race or ethnicity is or how you're racialized, but also where you live. The role of local context is so important for shaping people's experiences um, with accessing healthcare and using particular types of public benefits. Um, so even with though in the context of this talk, I talked about the documentation status continuum and the racialized documentation status continuum in the context of health policy, it can also be tied to other types of public policy and other types of benefits in terms of thinking about lack of access uh, for different populations. And so thinking about the role of public policy creating these different classes of people, um, I suggest or argue that we will likely continue to see or see a more accelerated racialized citizen 
uh, versus non-citizen divide with immigrants and citizens of color being even made even more vulnerable within the current policy context and the current political climate. Uh, so a lot of the research on social and symbolic boundaries has demonstrated that there are starting to be significant increases uh, between those boundaries for immigrants and citizens of color. Um, and that this might also have other implications if we think about things like gender and social class. To what extent does being a man or a woman or being low income or high income also have an impact on what people's experiences will be within this continuum? Uh, certainly in terms of citizenship, certainly there will be a, uh, continue to be a stratified citizenry, uh, not only based on documentation status or race and ethnicity, but also some of these other dimensions as well. And what this particular framework demonstrates is that you can have the intersection of both de jure legal-based discrimination and de facto discrimination in some groups who will be doubly vulnerable to experiencing both, particularly immigrants of color. And so this has significant implications when we think about social inequality in our society and the increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots, citizens and non-citizens, uh, white Americans and people of color and thinking about the intersections between all of those different domains. Um, so just briefly, I just want to point out to some of the limitations of this work. Um, it's based on a small sample in the city of Boston, is which is considered to be more progressive. Um, but one of the things to think about is how might this play out in other immigrant friendly or, or the more hostile context. Um, and more, more or less racially diverse locales. So, you know, in terms of thinking about uh, this being in the context of Chicago, this is also a very diverse uh, city, it also has a number of immigrant populations. What are some of the things happening on the ground here that might make the Boston context similar to or different from Chicago? Um, and so, in terms of thinking about this issue and the role of shifting policy regimes, um, certainly what we've seen at the federal level in terms of attempts to get rid of Obamacare, thinking about these new shifts in immigration policy. Um, so what are the impacts of this in this current socio-political climate? So certainly much more research needs to be done to examine this particular issue. Um, and so I'm gonna actually get ready to wrap up the talk so there'll be some time for discussion. But one of the things that I do want to say for me in terms of thinking about this particular project is that thinking about the impact of the last couple of years and the Trump effect, the last time I collected data for this project was during the presidential primaries in 2015 and 2016. And even at that time when it looked like Donald Trump was going to emerge as the nominee, his name was coming up in my interviews with people saying, oh my gosh, if, he's get elect, gonna, if he gets elected, people are going to stop. Um, People here in Boston are going to probably, or immigrants are going to stop signing up for coverage. They're going to be afraid to do that. Um, I even heard accounts of people saying that, you know, I'd be eligible to apply for my citizenship, but I'd be afraid to because if I submit my paperwork under this administration, that could be cause for me to get deported. So these concerns about, am I going to improve my position in the continuum by moving towards citizenship, given what's happening in the current socio-political climate? Or am I going to be afraid and sort of withdraw from using these particular benefits that I already have access to because of the vulnerable, vulnerability that I feel? Um, and so in light of that, my plan is to do a final set of data collection to see how all of these policy shifts are having an impact in the Boston area so that I will have these three different time periods. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions. But thank you so much for your attention.